Precious audience, greetings. May this afternoon be as adorable as you. No word can define our gaiety here to stand in front of such beautiful faces. My name is Abir Harash and I am a first year of baccalaureate student. And my name is Zainab Sijahida, a common course student. And we are very thrilled to be able to host with you today our third showcase event. And so with all of you, you are so welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, true enough that this club wouldn't be here and it will always just be in our imagination. But thanks to our leader, wait, that's too formal, he's our friend, the most trusted person, a sibling, he's our family. Without you, uh, Mr. Hussam, without you, none of, this, uh, none of these things would happen. Thank you. Please welcome Mr. Hussam. Okay, what can I say after this lovely introduction? Nothing. Dear testers, honored guest speaker, greetings to all of you. First of all, I would like to congratulate each of you for what we have achieved so far as a club and as a community of inspired thinkers. It is really gladdening and heartwarming to see how committed you are, especially under these dire and dreadful circumstances. Please keep moving forward with your TED journey, enjoy what you're doing, and success will always follow. Now. We have said that this is going to be our last showcase event, our last showcase, but it's not going to be our last event and certainly not the last event of the year. God forbid, we're just getting started. It is going to be a combination of talks, uh, um, musical performances, and a great psychology masterclass by Dr. Hind Buidar. So you are in for a treat. One more thing, I would like to extend my sincere thanks and appreciation uh, for the hard work and dedication provided by the club officers, and in particular, uh, Aya Berkush, club president, Wissal Shadi, <laughs> vice president, the events officers, Fatim Zahra and Hadil, the security <laughs> officer, Medina Nasiri, and let's not forget the people working behind the scenes, the teams, uh, the organizing team, the backstage crew, as well as, well, the security team, Yunus, Amr, and Aweb. Thank you so much. <laughs> now, I would like to end this on a high note with screenwriter and American writer uh, Shonda Rhimes, uh, her famous quote, the world has plenty of dreamers, um, and while they're busy dreaming, the really happy people, the really successful people, the really engaged and amazing people are busy doing. Now obviously she's pushing people to become doers instead of dreamers. However, I really want you to become both. Dreamers, doers, and eventually successful testers. Now ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pleasure that I declare the third and last showcase event well and truly open. Thank you so much. Classic, soft, loud, fresh, catchy, drilling, joyful, gloomy, impressive. All of these words could be united in one, music. And today we are super glad to introduce two of the most unique voices that we have in our school. So, since we're talking about music, what's a better way to welcome them other than to drum roll? So I want all of you to drum roll. Now, please welcome Imam Muflih.
mystery ride And I'm so dizzy Don't know what hits me But I'll be alright My head's underwater But I'm breathing fine You're all crazy And I'm out of my mind Cause all of me Loves all of you Love your curves and all your edges All your perfect imperfections Give your all to me I'll give my all to you You're my end and my beginning Even when I lose I'm winning Cause I give you all Do I have to tell you Even when you're crying You're beautiful too The world is beating you down I'm around Down every moon You're my downfall You're my muse My worst distraction My rhythm and blues I can't stop singing It's ringing In my head For you Underwater, but I'm breathing fine. You're all crazy, and I'm out of my mind. Cause all of me loves all of you, love your curves and all your edges, all your perfect imperfections. Give your all to me. I'll give my all to you You're my end and my beginning Even when I lose I'm winning Cause I give you all And you give me on the table they're both showing hearts and in it all their hearts cause all of me loves all of you love your curves and all your edges all your perfect imperfections give your all to me Even when I lose, I'm winning Cause I give you all of me And you give me all of you Hello again, dear audience. We're extremely pleased to have the opportunity to, uh, to introduce our honorable guest speaker that I suppose we all know, Ms. Hind Boydar.
at the American hospital and last but not least her own personal cabinet. Now I want you all to give the most wonderful welcome to this powerful and amazing woman, Hind Voidar. Hello everyone, I'm really glad and happy to be here among you and I want to thank uh, this beautiful human being, uh, Mr. Hussam, for inviting me over and I'm really uh, blessed and really honored to be here today. Uh, so. <laughs> I've been asked to uh, give a, a quick introduction about psychology to you guys, so I'll be really happy to answer to every question you have uh, right after the presentation. And please, if you're interested in the, uh, in the field, uh, I'll be more than glad to talk to you in person afterwards. That's it. Okay. Can we start? Okay, thank you. So uh, the basic three questions that I'm um, about to uh, try to answer to during this uh, session is what is psychology? What does a psychologist uh, do? How does he work? Uh, what's a psychotherapy? So I think that those are the bases that uh, you guys need for, for today. But of course, if there's any specific question, I'll be happy to, uh, to provide the answers. Okay. so. This is going to be uh, academic for you guys. Just uh, I'll try to make it uh, keep it simple. So uh, according to to um, uh, Google and whatever uh, academic uh, text we have, psychology is the science dealing with mental phenomena and processes. It means that it studies every emotion, way we perceive the world, uh, uh, the intelligence, the consciousness, we'll talk about this and we we'll try to um, understand what are the uh, psychological concepts I think uh, you, you would need to uh, know about today. And the relationship between thoughts, cognitions and behaviors. Uh, so it's basically just the, the, the study of the mind, of how we all uh, react to environments, how to, we uh, end up having emotions, and starting from those emotions, how we make decisions about um, our daily life and our daily behaviors. Thank you. <laughs> so I think this will uh, interest you, maybe the slide is kind of interesting for, for you as uh, young teenagers and, and future adults. When do we need to go to therapy? So yeah, uh, when, when the talks to, the, to friends and family doesn't help anymore because uh, friends could be, uh, you know, really uh, caring and willing to help and family also but sometimes we don't really need uh, for we don't really need advices or people to judge us so we we start to feel that this help is a little uh, helpless at the end of, of all and it's it's not it doesn't help as much as it, it could hurt sometime also. Because what, what stands for someone would not be okay for some other person. Okay, second uh, reason why you need, we could go to therapy is if we have a hard time speaking in public. So I think that's the main uh, issue you talk, you're dealing with as, uh, in this club. If you have any anxiety, as I have now, <laughs> and uh, if you you have the shy uh, profile personality, so yes, it could be helpful to see either a coach or a psychologist to help you have some methods to, uh, to overpass what we call social anxiety. If I'm in pain because of my fa family issues or personal or, or love issues or whatever, uh, and I don't feel understood, so this is what I was talking about. It really, uh, sometimes we can be surrounded with the right people and still it wouldn't be enough uh, for us to feel understood or to overpass whatever um, problem we have uh, with our emotions or with our behavior. Uh, if I no longer feel joy 
and it's lasting for over a month. So this is a criteria, main criteria of depression. And uh, teenagers are really, really um, concerned with this, uh, with this uh, phenomenon. It's really, uh, we know that neurologists has proved that uh, as, as, as soon as we have puberty, uh, dopamine, which is uh, a hormone of, of uh, happiness and activity, really goes down. Uh, with, with teenagehood, so uh, depression is a main uh, flaw in, in uh, uh, the whole process of teenagehood. If my, t if my fears are affecting my everyday life, so we're all allowed to be uh, scared of things. <laughs> it could be phobias, it could be just uh, usual everyday uh, fears, but whenever it starts to affect my uh, life at school or at home or with my friends, and uh, I see my, my um, production going down or uh, my depression being, leading me to aggressiveness, for example, so because fear has a direct link with aggressiveness. So whenever we cannot manage fear, we could tend to be more and more aggressive. So yes, we, we're gonna need a, a tire therapy for that. If I uh, have been through traumatic, traumatic event, traumatic event, and I can't overpass the trauma on my own, what is a trauma is really uh, our response, our body and emotional response to uh, some unusual events something that we're not supposed to live, uh, that our brain is not prepared to deal with. Uh, so it could be an emotional heart heartbreak, could be uh, a car accident, it could be anything that is sudden and does affect us with symptoms like um, nightmares, uh, keep seeing the same uh, picture all over, over again, uh, having huge anxiety and going to uh, uh, nervous breakdown or, or depression. Okay, so uh, there are different types of psychology. Uh, where I'll just uh, listed the most uh, famous, but then there are other kind of psychology that we don't have here in Morocco. So uh, the most famous one is the clinical psychology. It's really to be uh, accompanying people who need uh, f psychological support for any uh, any reason. It could be in a clinic, it could be in a, in a cabinet, it could be uh, at school or whatever it is, but it's, it's called clinical psychology. <laughs> cognitive psychology, we'll, we'll see what cognitive means. Uh, it's really what I'm specialized in. Cognitive and behavioral psychology is uh, basically just dealing with the thoughts that are and uh, and adapted to reality that are uh, negative thoughts that lead us to negative emotions and we end up to, uh, having uh, toxic behaviors. So we'll, we'll talk about this later on. And developmental psychology is uh, the psychologists that are specialized in uh, the evolution of childhood since the young childhood till, uh, till teenagehood so this, and all its phases. It's called developmental psychology, and there's social psychology, which is different than uh, sociology, uh, because we it's really psychology adapted to groups. It could it could uh, concern the uh, group therapies. If I think we already heard about that, all of us. Uh, it could um, concern just this the psychology study of any social group uh, within a company or uh, any institution whatsoever. Thank you. How does a psychologist work? Well, I'm sure that my colleagues, if they see this slide, will be, they'll be laughing, but I'll just try to keep it simple again. So a psychologist does not prescribe medicine, first of all. So yes, psychiatrist does prescribe medicine. A psychologist works with exercises, with active listening, uh, and exercises in, in the, um, at every therapy session. And we could also give exercises to do outside if uh, the, the patient is, is okay with that, sure. Uh, does not give advices, so that's, that's the main difference between us and counselors. Uh, we never give uh, advices, and I think that most of people think the opposite. We just help the patient uh, figure out whatever <laughs> options he has uh, according to what he's going through, and then we just help him out choosing the uh, less uh, damaging uh, way, and we uh, accompany him through the, 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 the road. Uh, a psychologist never judges a patient, um, so 
we all know that we, we try as friends not to do that, but it's very hard to be to remain neutral when um, there are interests involved, when there are uh, we have too much empathy, or when we can no longer, uh, you know, ha have um, uh, a scientific uh, thinking. <laughs> okay, so main method is the active listening. What is that? It's, it's uh, to be able to listen and be having feedbacks. We In psychology and psychotherapy, we have a lot of feedbacks. In classical psychoanalysis, there are not as much feedbacks as, as in um, CBT. We'll, we'll see about that. So really need to, ha to be active in the listening. And it, uh, whereas uh, psychoanalysts just say, uh, well, basically, they'll hate me for that. They just get, uh, you know, they repeat the last of the, the sentence you just said at, uh, with, with a question mark. So like, this, this is really, really different from our method, but uh, yes, the listening needs, needs to be active. Uh, it's neutral, as we said, so no emotions uh, what, uh, from, from the uh, psycho, psychotherapist uh, is allowed. It's benevolent, meaning uh, uh, bienveillant, so we're, we're supposed to help uh, people get better and we if we can't do that we reorient to colleagues or we stop the uh, sessions if we see that uh, we don't have the abilities uh, with a case we just stop sessions but as in medicine the worst thing worst case scenario is to uh, add damages to uh, the psychological state of a patient <coughs> Being empathic, not over empathic. Empathic means just being able to be in uh, the patient's shoes without uh, uh, reflecting its emotion. We all have different emotions, even if we live the same, uh, the exact same situation. We we never uh, live. Uh, have the same emotions exactly. Uh, it changes from a person to another, which is uh, normal because e everyone has a print, even everyone has neurological prints and emotions. Even fear is not the same for me as for you, for example. It has different expressions, and as much expressions as there are people. Helps person understand reasons of uh, thoughts and behaviors. We need to understand before we heal. If we don't know why we're scared, uh, we could give all the exercises possible. We've been, it could be repeated again. It could happen again, and it could get even even worse if you if you don't identify the real reasons why it, it first happened to you. I think that's it. Yeah, have produce and relieve uh, emotional and psychological suffering. Uh, yes, so that's what we do. <laughs> Thank you. Next slide, please. Okay, so I I was trying. I just tried to. Uh, list up a few concepts. I don't know if, if this would be boring to you guys. Just tell me as as we go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, what is psychoanalysis? Psychoanalysis. La, 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 psychoanalysis. So, uh, Sigmund Freud, who launched the the concept of uh, psychoanalysis, is the treatment of someone who has mental problems by asking them about their feelings and their pasts, especially uh, young childhood to try to discover what may be causing their condition, but mainly it works with, uh, we work with those, those um, uh, concepts, consciousness, subconsciousness, and consciousness. And those things are, are um, showed here, and I don't know if you can see the image. The conscious mind is uh, above like five to 10% uh, the presentation of our brain, of its abilities and whatever we, we, uh, we use of it. We all know that even orcas are the only one who use uh, uh, approximately 10% of their brain. We only use 5% five, five, five of it. <coughs> and so uh, same for consciousness. It means the part of the brain that makes us realize uh, and be aware of what we, we're living and we're feeling at every second. <coughs> and. So, conscious mind contains all of the thoughts, memories, feelings, uh, memories that we, we, can, we are aware of, and wishes of which we are uh, aware at, at any given moment. Subconscious, that's the middle part. That's 
pre-conscious or so-called, pre-conscious or subconscious, it means uh, memories that exist only at the subconscious level. Our subconscious mind registers things which our conscious mind is not aware of. So it's just something that in therapy we can access to uh, without needing uh, hypnosis, uh, whereas hypnosis deals with the really unconscious part. So the unconscious contains uh, uh, contents that are unacceptable or unpleasant or immoral, uh, mostly sexual and uh, destructive uh, instincts, <laughs> such as feelings of pain, anxiety, or conflict. So this part we need hypnosis to, to access to. And there's right brain, left brain, which we would be specifying in that slide. This is a very common con concept that is uh, more and more, um, you know, uh, not, not uh, discredited in neuro neurobiology, but still, it still works for a lot of uh, our studies. <laughs> so, most of us are either left-brained or right-brained. So mostly, it's really th those are the differences. So the left brain over here, it contains all what's mathematic, scientific, uh, what is uh, linear thinking, facts, uh, sequencing tasks or uh, sequencing informations. So all the, what you know. The nerd part of, uh, of of our brain, we all have one. And then there's, although I, I don't agree with, with, the, with, the, with the term nerd, but it's, it's just really the logic, logic uh, scientific part of our uh, intelligence. We all have one. No? And then we have the right parts. This is more linked to um, imagination, arts, music, uh, uh, rhythm, uh, intuition. Uh, non-verbal cues that, well, most of people have both of those parts uh, activated according to, to situations, but we all have a dominant. Uh, there's one uh, form of uh, job that really a activates both of them at the same time, is uh, in the architects. Architects have <laughs> uh, the creative uh, skills and also they, ha they need to have the mathematic and, and logic skills. <laughs> what is a psychotherapy? Well, the definition uh, again is ac academic. Uh, the treatment of behavior disorders, mental illnesses, uh, or any other condition by psychological means, listening exercises, and hypnosis. Uh, what does a psychotherapist do? Basically, is just uh, a professional that assists people. Uh, with various mental health conditions such as stress, depression, anxiety, insomnia, addictions, uh, bipolar disorder, negative behavior patterns, PTSD, post-traumatic syndrome disorder. Uh, well, bipolar disorder is, uh, well, has been written twice, sorry. Schizophrenia or just relationship issues uh, and other debilitating, uh, debilitating feelings. So yes, uh, psychotherapist is, is more than a psychologist, because, well, it's uh, different studies, added studies that um, uh, works with some technique that is called CBT, uh, Cognitive and Behaviorist Therapy. That's the difference between a psychotherapist and a psychologist. <laughs> Next slide, please. Thank you. Yeah, so what is CBT? Cognitive and Behavioral Therapies uh, are the, uh, uh, the most recent uh, methods of therapy, <laughs> and it's been... Uh, developed since the 60s in the uh, in US. Uh, it helps us identify unhealthy negative beliefs and, and, and thoughts and behaviors that are consequent of, the, of those thoughts and replace them with healthy positive ones. So we believe that uh, cognitions and uh, ideas, perceptions of, of the, the world, the, the external world, is the first point, first step of whatever we're feeling and what defines us as a, a person. Uh, see if you and I, for example, assist on a, a car crash and someone dies, I'll be like maybe, could it wasn't me and, and I'll just go uh, dancing and having fun with my friends, whereas someone hypersensitive would be, uh, will really leave a trauma and go at, uh, to his place and feel insecure about the external world and go to uh, uh, you know, depression or nervous breakdown. So it's really, and those beliefs really depend on 
uh, sometimes <laughs> um, genetic uh, status uh, on our education, on the free will and the way we 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 dealt we dealt with our education, uh, our personal uh, experiences through life. So uh, we only in the therapy we only work on whatever is uh, what is approaching to uh, free will. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, dialectical behavior therapy is the second part of uh, the cognitive uh, therapy. Uh, it's a part of CBT that teaches behavior skills. So we basically condition people differently from what they've been used to uh, to, to act around around their uh, in their lives. So we just really. Uh, like Pavlov, you know, the dog test, I don't know if you talked about it, already heard about it. Uh, we tend to help the patient condition himself with new ideas and new behaviors. Uh, to, in a way that he'll be less offended, less, less suffering uh, in reaction to a given situation. So, yeah, skills to help help uh, you handle stress, ma manage your emotions, and improve your relationships with others. So cognition is really uh, a mix of all, the, all those parts, human intelligence, language, uh, thinking and problem solving skills, memory, attention, and perception. Perception be being uh, the biggest part. <laughs> Next slide, please. Okay. What jobs, this, I will end up with this, uh, what job can I choose in psychology if, uh, if you're inclined to, to this field? So you could be psychologists, we know now the difference between psychologists and a therapist. Therapist uses uh, CBT, where psychologists use the clinical uh, methods. Human resources psychologists, so you'd be basically working in, uh, for companies and institutions uh, to help hire, um, follow the careers and uh, support whatever uh, emotional distress is linked to uh, everyday, everyday companies', companies uh, work. Uh, art therapists, uh, we use art therapy in CBT and it's just an amazing tool. Uh, we use it a lot with children. But you can also use it with schizophrenic and, uh, and uh, bipolar disorders. <laughs> uh, sports psychologists help them improve uh, their performances and, and uh, stay away from injuries, which needs a lot of concentration and uh, what we call uh, l'imagerie. So we, we, need, we tend to uh, perfection the, uh, the, 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 um, the gesture now the, the move by uh, hypnosis and sometimes half conscious hypnosis. And criminal psychologists, it's, it's a field that is spreading in Morocco, thank God. <laughs> so yeah, there's also military psychologists that is spreading uh, in Morocco. It's, it, it's uh, getting organized. Uh, yeah, so for those who, who are fascinated with uh, criminology, you know, God knows we're, we're a, lot, a lot of those. I think that's it. Yes, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ms. Bouida, for this amazing masterclass. I hope that your audience enjoyed it as much as I did. Now, that's better than listening. Now, what's better than listening to a musical performance to relax ourselves? To do so, please make some noise for Shad Ziati and Ryan Himrawi. I bust the windows out your car And no, it didn't mend my broken heart I probably always have these ugly scars But right now I don't care about that part I bust the windows out your car After I saw you looking right at her I didn't want to but I took my turn I'm glad I did it cause you had to learn, learn I must admit it helped a little bit To think of how you felt when you saw it I didn't know that I had the most strain But I'm glad you see what happens when You see you can just play with people's feelings Tell them you love them and don't mean it You'll probably say that 
that it was juvenile But I think that I deserve to smile Thank you Buenos dias de nuevo, which means hello again in Spanish. A teen who is amazed by psychology was always told that she is there in the perfect moment to find solutions. People's ar people around her always wondered how she could be so calm, even in the most irritating moments. That same teen is here today to show you her little secret, a skill that will help you, first of all, understand your feelings and those of people around you. She's here today to show you the receipt of a perfect cupcake where you have to whisk your feelings and those of your entourage where you'll be able to place a cherry on top, but that cherry would be nothing but the new skill, which is emotional intelligence. So please, dear audience, welcome with us our next state speaker, Neda Muneji. Look to your left. Now look to your right. One of your seatmates will probably be smiling at you right now. The other one is gazing at you with his lonely dark eyes, scowling at you with his lowered eyebrows. Dear audience, right now you might be thinking, oh, we're a grumpy man, he's out there ruining my happy day. Or, why is that woman frowning? Is she on her period? But you should know that what you just did was assuming what someone is feeling based on their facial cues. However, emotions are not simply read from expressions. Ladies and gentlemen, here I am today, standing here in front of you to talk about a topic that is particularly relevant to those of you who have the knowledge and smarts that allow them to be great at their job, but can't simply understand their own emotions and those of the people around them. Ladies and gentlemen, get ready, because the rocket is about to take off. Together, we'll embark on a quest, a journey to master your own emotions and analyze our topic of the day, which is emotional intelligence. First of all, I would like to give you an overview of what is emotional intelligence. According to Peter Salovey and John Mayer, emotional intelligence has been defined as the ability to monitor one's own and other people's emotions, to discriminate between different emotions and label them appropriately, and to use emotional information to guide thinking and behavior. Well, that's too hard, right? To put it simply, it is the ability to manage your own emotions and those of the people around you, leading you to empathize with others and overcome any challenges you may encounter in life. When you are emotionally intelligent, it means that you are aware of your own feelings, whether positive or negative they are, and that you can accept the latest ones using them for your own benefit. Now I'll go on to highlight what I see as the five main key elements to social intelligence. First of all, we have self-awareness. Second of all, we have self-regulation, motivation, empathy, and last but not least, social skills. Shall we move to some storytelling? This is the story of two twins, Jack and Oliver. They both grew up with no parents and both had the same academic path, yet they have no completely different lives. Jack is a businessman who believed from his youngest age that his happiness matters and found a way to cope with his sadness all alone. That's when we recall self-awareness. Oliver is now a homeless man who's always drunk and who has no purpose in life. He believed that his parents were the one to blame and was always angry at his past. Jack always liked cars and was amazed by the way they were made. He took Henry Ford as his role model, and that's what led him to achieve where he is now and work harder. That's when we recall motivation. While Oliver never really put a goal to begin with and kept stuck in his past. Jack always won people's hearts by listening to them and trying to comfort them. That's when we recall empathy. While Oliver always pushed others, blaming the society for his fate. Both men had the same story, yet they grew up differently. Both men had emotions, yet one used them for his own good, while the other didn't master his emotions. If people understood that emotional intelligence is the intersection of both heart and head, they would have felt differently. My aim is to push you to listen. Listen to the world in its different forms. When you perceive the world from another point of view, 
a different one from yours, you can understand the situation, thus be more able to manage your emotions. The three steps are see, feel, experience. By that, you'll be a better parent, leader, and friend. Thank you. Thank you, Neta, for this inspiring speech. Now, please, I want you to welcome the kindest person here is going to talk about something we forgot about nowadays, a skill we don't know about that much, and it is enjoying your own company. Please give a round of applause for Aya Ahengir. Oh my God, look at her sitting there all alone. She must be sad and has no friends. I've heard such things being said to people just doing their own things, which made me believe that being alone is a bad thing. It must be sad and lonely. You should never end up like that. That's what I told myself. So in order to do as I said, I started making new people and hanging out with, <laughs> I started making friends and hanging out with new people. But I wasn't really feeling it. Almost all of the friends I've made weren't really my friends. Some of them were fake and others were just there. That's when I started asking myself, do you even need friends? Is staying alone that scary? Yes, I was scared of staying alone, thinking that people will pity me and maybe hate me. But I was wrong. You may ask, why, how come? Well, these past three or four years, I've tried to sit alone and talk to myself about all my feelings, concerns, and all the things I wanted to talk about. And surprisingly, it was good. It was really fun. I loved spending time with myself and enjoyed talking to myself about all the things that I didn't get to enjoy, that I didn't get to discuss with any friend I've ever made. That's when I realized that enjoying your own company would make you start liking yourself more and discovering more about it and also gaining more confidence. And I've hated it because people made it seem as if it was a horrible thing. That, that's why I chose enjoying your own company as an important skill for the future. And uh, as Olin, Orrin Wells once said, we n we're born alone, we live alone, we die alone. So why not enjoy it rather than cry about it? Thank you. <laughs> Chills all over our bodies. Thank you so much, Safia, for this amazing piano performance. Now, let me ask you, dear, uh, dear audience, a question. What does adaptation mean to you? Now, to answer this question, I want you to welcome very loudly the sweetest person here to answer it. Please clap hands for Aya Smash. Uh, Aya sorry. Don't you think it's fascinating how the person you were last month or two years ago is relatively different from who you've become today or the person you might be tomorrow? I think we all agree that in life everything is constantly changing and nothing remains the same for too long. Let's take this shirt I'm wearing, for example. I think it's trendy, but it might be old-fashioned tomorrow. It might have already become old-fashioned yesterday. You might be living your comfortable, peaceful life, and all of a sudden, you somehow find yourself in a new environment with people you've never even met before. Actually, something quite similar to this situation happened to me about a year ago. I was one happy teenager, enjoying my life, going to school every morning, seeing my friends and teachers. The next thing I knew, there's a global pandemic, and we have to study from home. I think 
it is safe to say that life is all about changes. No one and nothing guarantees that someone you love won't die sooner than you wanted them to. That your best friends today might not even remember your name 20 years from now. The rich may become poor and the poor may become rich, we never know. But what we do know is that the best way and frankly the only option we have to deal with all of the changes of life is to adapt to them. Yes, you cannot control what will happen in the future, but you most definitely can control the way you handle it. Changes are inevitable. Let's face it, if nothing ever changed in your life, it would be boring. So why fight these changes when you can accept and embrace them instead? You might think that today, you might think that something is the worst thing that has ever happened to you, but in 30 years, you might think that it was actually awesome. Flexibility and, ad and adaptation is a crucial skill that we must acquire in order to move on because life continues, life must go on, we have to move on, we have to move forward. It is a skill that we must learn and acquire because we will always need it whether it be two hours from now or six years from today. Thank you. Now, in which language should I say it? Oh, hello, Vida. Time management is one of the key success. It teaches you patience and how to tackle difficult tasks in a time. So, what is basically a time, ma time management? That's the exact question that our tele <laughs> will answer. So, please also give her a soft round of applause. To be completely honest, when I first started writing this speech, as soon as I read my first draft, I came to the realization that all I was saying was basically what anyone would say about time management and how important it is. Like, yes, Sherlock, we know that having an organized schedule is good for you and all. But once I started getting deeper into this topic and um, I I realized that all I've ever known about it was only the tip of the iceberg, especially when I came across this brilliant TED talk by Brad Aon that talks about the philosophy of time management. He explains that time management was, during ancient times, a purely philosophical concept. As for now, it has become philosophically empty for the simple reason that we tend to associate time with money. He also says that time only becomes precious when we realize that it is limited. But first and foremost, what is time? The indefinite and continued progress of existence and events in the present, in the past, present and future regarded as a whole. So existence, which is limited, we can look at it as a simple equation that implies that time does in fact have an ending point. On the other hand, time management, uh, I mean management, means the process of dealing with or controlling things. However, we often tend to mistake time management for spending every last second of your life trying to get things done and be productive, whereas in reality, it is so much more than that. It is more about realizing and recognizing the fact that we all have a limited amount of time, but that is enough for us to do what we truly want to spend our lives doing. As the writer Ernest Hemingway once said, every man's life ends the same way. It is only the details of how he lived and how he died that distinguish one man from another. And lastly, I would like to talk about this famous phrase that we all use, I don't have time. No, don't try to act innocent, we've all said it at least once in our lives. The biggest man in the history of mankind is one that man created himself and still continues to believe. Now I may sound like an old lady saying this, but we can't deny the fact that in this day and age, everything became so much easier and less time consuming, from sending a text to traveling the whole world. 
So why do we still allow our minds to trick us into thinking that we're under so much of this non-existent pressure? Yes, in the end, it all comes down to this one simple but complicated thing we all own, our mind. This asset is really the key to finding all of the answers, and controlling it would mean finally finding the balance that you need in your life and understanding what time means for you. Thank you. Thank you, Fatem Zara, for this brilliant speech. Now, to take a break and bliss your ears at the same time, I want you to make some noise for the powerful duet Shad and Aweb, who are going to perform one of the most amazing songs written and uh, written by Aweb.
Bravo. You did amazing. Oh, you did amazing. And here we are again. See, I've been told you, they have missed us standing together. True enough, I can see that now. Anyways, then I've been Ara going to let our place up here for our delegate and uh, for our president and vice president come up and take our place up here to do their interview and ask uh, our honorable guests some meaningful questions that will be helpful for all of us here. Especially the ones who love everything related to psychology. So please give the loudest welcome to our Miss President and our Miss Vice President. I have a question. Hello, Miss Vice President. Miss, how are you? Good. It is such an honor to have you here with us. Same have here. you um, answered to our questions? Okay. <laughs> you okay. It's so, an expression on the face. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have a couple of questions. We have a couple of questions that we wanted to ask you, uh, especially uh, about psychology. So my first question is, uh, what is a typical therapy session like? Okay, well, a uh, typical session therapy, well, CBT, uh, mm -hmm. is, is different by, but than the others, is really basically to uh, introduce myself first, and then the patient introduces himself or herself, and then she um, asks, she gives her demand, uh, and then I gather and I collect information about her or him uh, as much as I can, and then we just uh, agree on, on the action plan, uh, and since the very first session, I can give some document the documents to, to read or uh, some videos to listen to, some hypnosis also to listen to, listen to while during sleep. And then we agree on the number of sessions that is approximately uh, uh, coherent according to the demand and, and uh, the diagnosis we, we set on the first session. Yeah. That's really interesting. Wissal, would you want to ask something? So there is this pandemic that has been going on for about a year or so now and everyone has been scared and everything because just of a tiny little virus that is caused by a physical reason. Now, what I've been interested in recently was a look into the future that said that there's not going to be any more of physical epidemics but more of a psychology one. Like we see some people having mental illnesses and it's becoming more and more normalized that almost we can picture a future where everyone has it, but cannot really heal it. So the question will be now for us in this moment and for the future too, what does it mean to be exactly mentally healthy? And that is the question. What is mentally healthy? Yes. Or what are the, uh, well, I can um, try to propose an answer in two parts. First of all, I'll start by talking about the uh, illnesses or, or the, uh, uh, psychopathologies that has been uh, uh, occurring since uh, since COVID. Uh, mostly, it's really germophobia, mostly, and depressions. Depressions uh, consequent to whatever family issues happen happening uh, during the lockdown. Uh, um, some families blowed up, blowed up, uh, blowed up, and they, they, they exploded, and the man. Massive um, phobias, germophobias, uh, hypochondria, fear, being fear of being sick, any sickness whatsoever, not even related to germs, and, uh, and also a uh, big, big, big amount of, of the nervous breakdowns and, and uh, because of the financial struggle and, and, um, and the, yeah, instabilities in, in every, every way. So yeah, what is being mentally uh, balanced is really uh, to be free of uh, pathological anxiety, we all are supposed to be scared in, in those moments. Yeah. Uh, it's been a, almost a year that our, our uh, how do you call it? Yes, the repères, <laughs> sorry, 
uh, we we are like in some trouble times where there's no security, no financial security, no emotional security, uh, where people we have to deal with uh, pathological uh, depressions and, and and as I said earlier, scare being scared can lead you to be uh, being aggressive. So yes, a lot of people has changed into uh, more aggressiveness. Uh, so yes, being balanced nowadays is simply uh, being able to cope with our fears without uh, harming other people, without harming ourselves. Okay, thank you, Miss, for answering this question. And it's really thoughtful of you, like getting here on stage and talking about uh, psychology, especially that a lot of people are interested in. So that will lead to the next question that is related to your lecture. Mm. And that will, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I've heard you talk about, like in your speech, I heard you talk about relationship issues and issues uh, between two people who love each other. Mm -hmm. So, to you, what is manipulative behavior to you? Manipulative behavior? Yeah. Well, there's, uh, it's interesting you're asking about that. Uh, there's this profile, it's called uh, Narcissistic Perverse Manipulate Manipulator. Uh, which is really in fashion since a few, a few years uh, now. Uh, we hear about it in radios a lot. Uh, and yes, so, so basically uh, this profile is someone that, that um, is perverse, meaning that he likes to harm other people. He likes to be in possession and in, in, en emprise, mean be in control of some other people, someone else after having broken. Uh, his or, or weakens his, his self-esteem. So it's really mainly a p uh, possessive relationship, toxic one, yeah, of course, uh, based on a few phases. First one is seduction. Uh, him, him or her could be like the, the Prince Charming, Princess Charming at, at first. Uh, second of all, it could also happen to mothers and, 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 and fathers. Uh, second part is really the uh, uh, being here and not being here, working on proximity, uh, being secure and then uh, being aware and, and uh, unreachable, uh, away and unreachable. So uh, he creates uh, a dependence so that the, the victim will just ask for his presence, whatever he does to her, or it doesn't matter. Third uh, parts is really to uh, break by criticism and uh, the negrements, you know, uh, uh, constant criticism, uh, break this person's, this person's uh, self-esteem. And there's another step where uh, he or she tries to isolate her from her family, friends, so he, can, uh, he or she can control her uh, easier. Uh, and then there's the uh, uh, the harm and uh, face. So just it could be physical, it could be uh, mental. It's just constant, uh, uh, you know, self um, bad treatment. Yeah. And then there is the letting down. Just let the, the, the person is not in, no longer interested by his victim because uh, he doesn't feel joy. He doesn't suck on his energy anymore because there's no no more energy left left. So he tends to look for other victims, but as soon as this, the, the victim, the former victim, tries to stand up or get better, he'll, he'll still harm her, just, not even, even if he's not no longer interested in her. So just so she doesn't get, get uh, on her feet back in, that's it. Yeah, that's really bad. And I yeah, think it's bad. really necessary to raise awareness, especially here in Morocco, since not a lot of women know that and not a lot of people know that. So I think it's really necessary to raise awareness about that. Well, uh, sadly, our culture uh, it tends to um, encourage this profile on the way they raise brother, uh, sons differently than, than uh, yeah. daughters, and that uh, we're supposed to just uh, accept whatever the father or or, or the husband does. So it's it's encouraged. It's, it's encouraged by the culture. This, as I as I want to say, like. Uh, this this is an opportunity for us to speak out about it and to actually talk about it more. So I think it's a beginning to to change. Uh -huh. Well, I wish that the, the few people that are here just acknowledge and so from now on that this profile could easily be your friends or, or your family or someone mm -hmm. from or even you <laughs> yourselves uh, and to be aware that 
uh, we are uh, per the narcissistic perverse is really hard. Those people never come to therapy uh, because the way they process and their relationships are so empowering them that they, they, as long as it functions, they, they wouldn't uh, question it. Wissal, would you want to add something? Yes, I wanted to ask something regarding your job. Now, one thing that I've noticed when searching up uh, your field, Miss, is that we have different sessions for each type of people. So we have sessions for children, adults, and families. So I would, see, I would say, have you worked more with the children or with the families or adults? And which one was your favorite to heal or to just simply treat? Well, I'm not specialized in children, uh, not uh, beyond uh, eight, eight, yeah, not beyond eight year old. Uh, I'm not specialized in teenager neither, but I'm just specialized in CBT. So whatever comes, uh, what I like to, uh, what I enjoy, uh, you know, uh, following that as therapy is mostly uh, anxiety therapies because uh, it, it could so. so uh, it brings so much results. It's really uh, operating really pr pretty well. Uh, anxiety, like panic uh, attacks. Yeah. There are a lot of those since uh, COVID. Panic attacks, uh, anxiety, you, social phobias, so social uh, anxiety, being shy. Those who have great results also. Uh, yeah. well, and, and couple therapy. I, like, <laughs> I personally like couple therapy as well. Okay, thank you and we're all welcome to be here with you and now, since we have this amazing audience, it sure has a lot of questions for you, Miss, to answer and we'll get to the Q&A right now at this moment. Yeah, I think we asked enough questions, so let's, yeah, enough questions. <laughs> let's give the mic to the audience. <laughs> Who has any questions about psychology or... Okay. You can come over here if you want to. Okay, uh, this might be a little personal question, but once uh, you were interested in the psychology realm, what was like yeah, the first, uh, I don't know, your first insights? Like what was the job that you first knew about it in psychology and did you actually follow it? And why did you exactly follow clinical psychology and CBT? Why exactly that? Okay, I didn't get the first part of the question. Oh, the first part is uh, once you were interested in the psychology field, uh, why did you choose clinical psychology out of the different seven perspectives and types of psychology? Why exactly the clinical and CBT? Okay, well, clinical psychology is really because uh, that's the only uh, type that is offered in Morocco, in Casablanca, there's this L'Ecole uh, uh, Supérieure de Psychologie. Now there are more more schools, there's also the, the, the university, the public university, uh, especially in Mohammedia, uh, but because really that was the only type that was offered. It was, that school was um, uh, psychoanal psychoanalysis uh, obedience, but then uh, I, I chose to, uh, to add uh, on, on the um, uh, for further studies, uh, that's CBT studies, because we know now that it takes a lot less time it's more efficient on most uh, pathologies, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's really proactive. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask, like, what are some ways or like tips that we can use to keep our sanity and to keep like being actually healthy and avoid toxicity? Yes, sure. That's a very interesting question. Uh, well, most of us have skills. Have you, you talked about emotional skills, emotional intelligence. This is our key uh, to uh, keeping healthy, uh, to remain healthy. So we all have artistic uh, skills. We all have some have spiritual skills. Some have uh, sports skills. Uh, some have intellectual skills. Those all those types of skills are all uh, here to help us cope with whatever uh, struggling we're going through in life. So uh, it's, it's as if uh, the universe or God, or call it whatever you want, uh, has already given us the, the tools to adapt uh, to 
uh, suffering periods and, and also to, to, to joyful periods. So we all have the keys within us. We just need to uh, use them. So it's, you know, um, in a perfect uh, way, it could be a combination of all those. So sports, spirituality, uh, sex also helps a lot. Uh, any uh, uh, intellectual activity, uh, and a lot of relax relaxations, and also a lot of studies have proven that uh, people who are looking for every day's uh, happiness, every day's uh, sources of of, uh, uh, of happiness, of just the, the, the petit bonheur, little happinesses, just uh, keeping, it's as if you, you would gather some bank uh, of joy, uh, the neurotransmitters, the hormones are serotonin, dopamine, uh, endorphin, and uh, oxytocin. The more you make yourself happy by the way, what you eat and what you do and uh, through the day and through your life, you, you gather this bank and you can uh, pick from it whenever you, you struggle. So someone who is al always uh, aware of the need of making him, uh, himself happy uh, wouldn't be stressed or, or uh, wouldn't uh, be, uh, have a, an emotional pathology or psychological pathology, not the same, not, not, not the same way as someone who uh, didn't have this bank, this, this uh, yeah, hormone bank in, in his head. I don't know if I answered the question. Thank you. I wanted to know how does the mind-body connection affect our emotions? Mind-body, okay. So yeah, CBT, uh, th there are two schools. There are people who think that uh, emotions come before, uh, before thinking, process, cognitive process. Uh, and I personally think the opposite. I think that really, uh, it really comes from the perception of each one. As I said earlier, uh, we don't perceive things and information in, in, in our world the same way. Uh, it's related to, neuro, uh, to um, uh, neurological and DNA data, uh, our education, what we got from it and what we didn't keep from it, our free will and our day-to-day uh, -day experience that makes us uh, have a certain perception. And from that perception, uh, we, our brain uh, basically gives an order to create some uh, some hormones and not some others. So as I said, if I see if I witness a car accident and I say, "Thank God it wasn't me," being selfish, <laughs> uh, I will my my brain will will order to just uh, produce serotonin, which is a hormone of of, of happiness and, and uh, uh, the plaisir. And I'll go enjoy my life and say, "Life is precious. I need to uh, have fun every day." Whereas someone else will will be scared and pathologically scared to 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 the to the stage of, of trauma, and then his brain will just stop and be blocked, and freeze and uh, and and, and uh, produce uh, cortisol, which is the, the stress hormone, and this this particular uh, hormone gives the order to the whole body to be affected uh, toxically. So the heart will be beating really fast. The muscles will be uh, blocked. Uh, we'll have some b blood pressure issues, etc., etc., insomnia, so, and, and etc. So uh, it will lead us to a pathological station uh, state. Sorry. So uh, really, the emotions are just our interpretation of uh, of hormones, and the hor those hormones are uh, the uh, the the expression of an order that our brain has made according to some perceptions. So first, it's uh, external information, data. Second, our perception. Third, the order that of, of uh, producing uh, emo uh, hormones that are interpreted as emotion. And then, within, uh, according to the hormones, we tend to uh, decide to go on one action or, or another. Is, is that clear? I don't know if I, my English is not that good. I feel so much more <laughs> cultivated right now with you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, 
Well, I was very much intrigued when you talked about our cognitive perception and the way we can change it when you referred to the experience of Pablo, where I believe it was uh, training of a dog with the power of habit. My question is, can we really rewire our brain to change our perception of life and to avoid doing some certain habits to become the best part, like the best perception of our, our own self? Can we avoid? To? Can we rewire the connections in our brain uh -huh. to like become a better person, the way they did with the dog? Yes. Well, as, as you may know, we're a little more complex than a dog. <laughs> Most of us is. <laughs> so yeah, uh, we cannot uh, reset ourselves 100%. We're just working on, on the free will part, as I said. Uh, some of our uh, fundamental uh, uh, set, set, setting will remain the same. Uh, some, some profiles of personalities are really rigid. They are there, they are staying there. We just change a few criteria or a few uh, uh, feeling, feelings or habits. Habits, yes, can, can be changed. Uh, unless it's uh, biochemical and, for example, schizophrenic or, or psychotic will never be empathic as any other. So whatever is biochemical is really hard to change, uh, but fear, uh, depression, uh, some other tox toxical, to toxic uh, emotions can change by changing uh, perceptions, emotions, and, 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 and habits. So yes, we can help condition uh, humans to, to change their habits if they're willing to, of course, and motivation, as you said to, to earlier, is a, gr a great part of emotional uh, intelligence. So we. People are not the same uh, as, as far as emotional intelligence uh, is concerned, but we have great uh, uh, results with, with the uh, high emotion intelligences. Yes, we can, we can process to condition uh, people differently. It takes time, it's called uh, desensibilization, and, uh, and, and we basically work with two processes, very easy, uh, simple to understand. Uh, it's le renforcement positif et le renforcement négatif. So negative reinforcement and positive reinforcement, just, just as Pavlov did. Uh, yeah, Any other questions? Hi. <laughs> How are you? Um, uh, I just, I'm a little bit curious about the dopamine hormone. You talk, uh, you've talked about earlier. And I heard it. Uh, I've heard about about it a lot, and I just want to know uh, some information about it. Uh, can you tell me, like, some more information about yes. the dopamine? Yeah, dopamine, among other hormones, are uh, produced by the brain whenever we need to be in action, mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's also linked a lot with the addiction process too. So, dopamine is, is like a capsule that carries. Uh, that could be filled with anything you put in it. If you put it in it, cannabis, <laughs> it, then our, you, you, your pleasure will, will majorly come from cannabis. If you put in a shopping uh, behavior, compulsive shopping behavior, which is a pathology, uh, do you hear me, girls? <laughs> so yes, it, then your dopamine and your pleasure will, will be conditioned by, by shopping. So it's fully really capsule more than other, any other thing, and we can uh, associate it to any, uh, any, any activity. But dopamine, yes, is, is a neurotransmitter that uh, helps us be in action, get, get to uh, be energized, uh, and, and feel uh, pleasure. And as I said earlier, uh, a lot of studies through the world uh, led to the fact that teenagers uh, at the beginning of puberty and, and even afterwards, uh, we, we, we can see that the dopamine is going increasingly down. Uh, it's, it could go to 50% less off of dopamine reserves that we have. So this is why teenagers tend to uh, need some uh, more proactive adrenaline activities and uh, just to, to, so they can feel themselves more, more alive, just as uh, fast driving or smoking uh, uh, weed or uh, having, you know, some, uh, some uh, toxic behaviors. Just, it's not their fault, it's really that neurologically uh, dopamine has been decreasing. Um, hello, I have uh, three questions. Sure. So, uh, first of all, I would like to know uh, like, 
do you think that people with mental disorders and PTSD who actually need to see not a therapist but like a psychiatrist, do you think that instead of being like healed by uh, medicines and stuff, do you think that they can just see a therapist and talk things out and just be healed? Uh, my second question is, do you think that if the whole world has like uh, been seeing therapy, uh, therapists and stuff, how do you think the world will evolve? I, I didn't get the second question, sorry. The second, oh. uh, like, uh, if the, everyone in the world uh, took like therapy uh -huh. and uh, started seeing therapists and like uh, talking their traumas out and everything, how do you think the world will evolve if everyone can, would see a therapist? Okay. Uh, never, never been asked this question, which is interesting. Well, the first one you, you asked if um, uh, what what are the uh, diagnoses that needs to lead to psychiatrists instead of psychologists, right? Is that was that your question? The first one. PTSD is is, is better uh, be treated by psychotherapy or psychiatry? Yeah, right. It's just PTSD. Yes, okay. So again, uh, it's, all, uh, it's all linked to if it's uh, a biochemical disorder. Uh, so the only uh, indications of a psychiatry, uh, an only psychiatry uh, therapy, which is only medicines, is uh, when someone is imbalanced chemically in his brain. So those are schizophrenia. Uh, bipolar di disorder, uh, multiple identity disorder, uh, being psychotic, psychopaths, uh, those really need some uh, change in, in, a, in a biochemical uh, balance in, in the brain. So a therapy would never lead to anything uh, conclusive if, if, uh, if it's only uh, therapy. But, but uh, again, studies have proven that uh, even the, the chemical and then the uh, uh, medicine that is not efficient enough. It sometimes, most of the time, it's not enough to, to have a definitive change. Uh, so yes, a company, uh, psychotherapy plus medicine for those cases is the best way to, to deal uh, with it. Whereas uh, people with only anxiety or uh, Emotional uh, struggling could easily come to ter therapy. Uh, uh, of course, we are not the same also as, as uh, psychotherapists. There are some eff uh, efficient ones, some less efficient as in any uh, other job. Uh, but yes, with, with a CBT, adapted CBT, we could easily uh, avoid medicine. Because as you know, uh, in Morocco, we still don't know the difference between psychiatrists and, and psychologists. And, as, and I personally receive a lot of teenagers that are uh, addicted to uh, uh, anxiolytic, inhibitor uh, the serotonin, and some neuroleptics that are, that are really addic addictive. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they even come and can even speak with me because they they they. they they have been reduced to uh, a vegetable, I'm sorry to say that. So yes, uh, as long as there's, there, there's not an office that, that uh, watches the practice of psychiatrists here in Morocco, it could be dangerous for uh, young people. Uh, the second question was, uh, do you, how would be the world if everyone was uh, in therapy? I believe I could be a happier world. <laughs> it would be a better world. I believe that we can avoid a lot of uh, tra traumatic dramas uh, and we can deal with some flaws a lo lot better. Uh, incest in Morocco is, is, uh, is horrible. It's so spread. We hear about it every day. Uh, people abusing children. Uh, those children cannot even speak, or teenagers, or whatever. Um, there's no such a thing as sexual education. There's no such a thing as a lot of a lot of tools that should should be already active uh, in schools. And, and I'm glad that uh, your school is doing this. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, uh, so psychology awareness is 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 uh, more than uh, uh, important in any society. 
And then therapies, of course, whenever someone is, is uh, uh, in suffering, as I said, sometimes family and uh, all other institutions, friends and, and, and school, and they, they, sometimes it's not enough because people have been trying and sometimes it just gets the problems uh, worse. Yeah. So this is where, where we act up. Yeah, I think that's it. Thank you so much for Thank answering you. all of our questions. Thank, Thank you. you for making me feel less dumb. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you so much. That Thank is such you. an honor. Thank you. So it was an honor for me too. Thank you for answering all of our questions. Dear audience, to bless your ears and spread chills all over your body again, I want you to welcome very loudly the talented Aweb. Hi. It's me again. Again.
Mata imashita ne, which means, um, hello again in Japanese. Japanese, I think our next speaker loves this particular language. Anyways, um, I'm so honored to present to you, dear audience, our, our skilled dead speaker is going to talk about how can a book change your whole perspective of happiness, success, and life. So please make some noise for our next dead speaker, Manal Haid. Do you really think you'd succeed in life with that grades of yours? Your parents said, looking at your report. You cried. Why are you wearing green, you ugly frog? Your bully said, laughing. You cried. <laughs> Stupid. Your teacher said under his breath while giving you back your exam paper. You cried. Next thing you know, you never wear that green sweater anymore, even though it was your favorite. You no longer give your report card to your parents, and you start, and you start cheating on your exams. They teach us at school a couple of life skills that hypothetically leads us to success. What are those? It's what we call the four R's. Writing, reading, arithmetic, and responsibility. One additional skill that would have helped you back then when you cried would be the art of not caring. And that's where this book comes in handy. It's called The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Wit. Now, contrary to what most of you might think when hearing the book's title, it actually isn't about not caring. In fact, it's quite the opposite. The initial goal of Mark Mason, the author of the author of this book, is to push the reader into figuring out what to care about and why. Upon reading this book, I've realized that the path to happiness and success is different from what we've been taught. Happiness is often related to wealth, and so the backwards law is born. The more desperately you want to be rich, the more poor and unworthy you feel, regardless regardless of how much money you actually make. The more desperately you want to be happy and loved, the lonelier and more afraid you become, regardless of who surrounds you. It's a never-ending cycle of pursuing what everyone tells you to pursue. The more you pursue feeling better all the time, the less satisfied you become. We care too much about avoiding problems and forget that solving these problems is what brings us joy. And not having a problem at all is itself a problem. And that's the total opposite of what we've been told. We've been told that a happy life is a problem-free life, when in reality a happy life is a problem-solving life. So instead of asking ourselves, how can I be happy and successful, and successful, we should consider asking ourselves, what kind of pain do we want in our life, and what are we willing to struggle for? It seems to me that the world is constantly lying to us, sugarcoating every aspect of life. Yet, we blindly believe it. Exactly how you believed your loving parents when they told you you were special. How you believed your teachers when they told you you were special. And exactly how you believed that Instagram ad that told you you were special. Well, sorry to break it to you, but you're not. As a matter of fact, no one is. I'm pretty sure all of us at a certain point felt special because of a certain someone, and that led us into feeling as though we deserve to be happy without sacrificing for it. Mark Mason, in his book, broke this entitlement into two forms. I'm awesome, and the rest of you all suck, so I deserve special treatment. I suck and the rest of you are all special, so I deserve special treatment. These two people on the surface seem to be opposites, but their behavior ends up being the same. They both end up having a delusional belief that the, wor that the world revolves around them and that they're the center, the center of attention, so they, so they start blaming people for their problems. On one hand, the one who feels superior blames others for not for not reaching his level. And on the other hand, the one who feels inferior blames others for being better than him. No one cares whose fault it was for your problems. Sure, you can blame people, but in the end, it's all on you. Just like they don't care if you hadn't cared and didn't believe them when they told you you were special, you would have never felt as though they owe you something in the first place because, frankly, they don't. It's all just in your head. If you're always worrying about what people think about you, the problem is not what people think about you. The problem is that you don't have anything better to worry about. And by now, you're probably like, okay, why should I care about what you're saying? Why should I care about this book? Well, you shouldn't. Thank you.
Thank you for this brilliant speech. Now, the basketball player that is going to take my place in very few seconds is going to talk about an interesting topic, and it is jobs that will disappear in the future. Please clap hands for Yahya Sarrar. During the last couple of decades, the human generation have experienced a huge growth in the development of technology. It has paved the way for uh, functional device, uh, multifunctional devices like the smartwatch, smartphone, and computers. It even mm, they are increasingly faster, more portable, and higher powered than ever uh, than ever before. Uh, let's not forget the other domains that also changed a lot, such as marketing. Assembly, assembly, manufacturing, and medicine. We all see how mechanical parts are fabricated, how cars and planes are assembling. Even their pain jobs nowadays are done by machines. You see, factories are beginning to switch to the automated uh, production and work. But what about that simple man working in a factory? What will he become? Now, what if I told you that by 2023, uh, many traditional careers won't, won't be the same as we know them. Some of them won't, will even disappear. Uh, we won't find them in our option list or even as a part-time jobs. There will be no fast food cooks, no bank tailors, no textile workers. Even taxi drivers will be, uh, will be replaced by uh, automatic car capable of driving, parking, and do whatever the customer wants to do. Another domain that will also disappear is the medical domain with all its options like surgery, dental uh, medicine, andrology, cardiology, and all of that. They will be using machines controlled by artificial intelligence and um, the able, of, uh, um, able to uh, scan, locate the issue, um, solve the problem and operate and give us the type of medicine necessary for our treatment. It also brings reliability and uh, efficiency far from the errors that can make a doctor. Well, the real question is the, the disappearing of these jobs. Do they have a negative impact on our society? Does it mean it will reduce chances of work? Well, I'll say Probably not. But they will appear new jobs that based on these, on these changes, such as uh, um, a robotics engineer, uh, AI specialist, uh, uh, cybersecurity uh, specialist, etc. All these in purpose to improve and optimize the Artificial, artificial intelligence in global. Well, these are the effects of technology on our future. Thanks. Sadly, this would be the last time for me saying hello again in another language. But anyways, now it's up to our next guest speaker who's going to talk how can an innovative and creative mindset be helpful for the future. So please give the warmest welcome to our next guest speaker with Satan Zukin. Creativity is intelligence having fun. Well, that's a quote that captured my mind while I was scrolling through Instagram, and today I decided to talk about it. So welcome all of you to my TED speech. To start, I'm going to give a simple definition of the two most important words of this quote, which are intelligence and creativity. Let's start by a quick definition of intelligence. It might seem useless to define such a simple word. After all, we all have heard this word hundreds of times, even more thousands, and probably have a general understanding of its meaning. 
However, intelligence has been defined in so many ways. First of all, a higher level ability, such as problem solving, decision making, etc. And the ability to learn, emotional knowledge, and the adaptation to, the, uh, to meet the demand of the environment effectively. And for the other part, creativity means being able to come up with your own clever idea. And also, it involves stepping outside the day-to-day to think up novel and unusual solutions. In addition, she's linked to passion. If you're passionate about something, you may be more able to think out of the box about it. Too often I hear people saying that they're just not creative, as if creativity was a rare quality. That's a too narrow way of thinking about it. It doesn't just involve, as some people think, producing a work of art. It exists among people in every department across job functions and levels. In the workplace, for example, creativity happens anytime an employee thinks of a new way to solve a problem, whether to improve the customer experience in some way or just speeding up a time-consuming process. Thought of in this way, it's clear that creativity doesn't, it doesn't just need it in some department within a company. It's a necessity for all. So let's get to the most exciting part. How can a creative and innovative mindset be helpful for the future? Nowadays, in the workplace, creativity has become a must-have. You might be wondering what does it do for a company or a business. Well, creativity in business is a way of thinking that inspires challenges and helps people find innovative ways and create opportunities out of problems. It's the reason some companies woe us with new amazing ideas, while others merely follow the beaten path. One of the necessary things that a business needs to be creative is to be successful, sorry, is creative thinking. Every business must be able to compete with their competitors and keep, and keep up with the latest trend of the industry. They have to make some decision to, make sh to ensure that productivity of the business increases. And to do that, a business owner needs to be creative. And in general, it is important in everyday life. It's because it makes life infinitely interesting and fulfilling. Also, human beings are essentially born creative. From emphasis on, we found ways to negotiate life. And the most creative people found ways around obstacles because they see them not just as roadblocks, but also as opportunities. And it helps you become a better problem solver in all areas of your life. Instead of coming from a logical approach, your creative side can approach the situation from all angles. And it helps you see things differently and, 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 you, and helps you become very confident. Being creative comes with many ups and downs and high risk of failure. You have to be vulnerable to share your art and willing to take the risk that what you create may never see the light of the day. <laughs> Engaging in the creative process is a great confidence builder because it makes you discover that what you cre that failure is part of that process. And once you see failure, that something is survivable and something that makes us grow and, and, and make our work better, you can release the fear and try new things, even at the risk of failing. And you can't use up creativity. The more you use, the more you have. As long as you think out of the box, you will be just fine. And as Albert Einstein said, creativity is contagious. So please, just pass it on. Thank you. So I guess it's our last time coming back to, pr to introduce someone, Abir. Oh, yeah, well, I guess so. But I'm sure that won't be the last time. Yeah, exactly. But believe me, I couldn't have asked for a better partner than you. Oh, thank you. Now, what's a better way to end our evening than having an ensemble performance? Exactly. They are ones of the most wonderful and amazing people we have in this club. And we are so, and we are so glad to have them perform today. 
So please everyone give a huge welcome to Shahid Ziyati, Sami Aytou Fqir, Awa Badmo, and Ryan Hamraoui. Let's fly or let them rain 